Okay, I guess I'm gonna get started now. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. Um, today I'll be describing uh, the work we've done over the past 10 years or so um, on using AI methods to enable rapid simulation of extreme scale physics models. And so the first thing you might notice from my title is that we aren't solving sort of a generic task for machine learning, right? We're not performing classification or regression. We have a very um, sort of tailored objective, which is that we want to somehow leverage tools from artificial intelligence to accelerate the simulations um, that correspond to, to computational physics models. All right, so what's the motivation for this work? So um, I'm not sure who in the audience is familiar with sort of physics-based uh, computational or computational physics or physics-based simulations, um, but if you're not aware, uh, the field of high fidelity physics-based modeling and simulation has really become indispensable across a wide range of applications in science, engineering, and entertainment because it provides a mechanism for accurately simulating the realistic performance of complex systems, um, the performance of autonomous agents in an environment, as well as interactions with virtual objects as we hope to do um, in VR. As such, physics-based simulation not only plays a critical role in the national security work that I did at my last employer, which was Sandia Labs, which is one of the um, Department of Energy Labs, but also plays, plays a surprisingly large role in the virtual and augmented reality work that we do at Facebook. However, as we, we rely more and more on these simulations, greater demands are often placed on their fidelity. And to ensure that these models have very high predictive fidelity, we must imbue them with very fine resolution, meaning that we have a lot of uh, resolution in both space and time. And this can lead to computational models that uh, can consume months on a supercomputer just to run one simulation. And so I'm showing some examples here from my former employer. And due to the high computational cost of these predictive models, there is a de facto computational barrier that prevents us from using these models for a range of time critical problems that are really important across these industries. For example, model, model predictive control in autonomous vehicles requires um, these, these uh, physics models to be solved in real time. Structural health monitoring for monitoring, let's say critical infrastructure requires models to be run on the order of minutes. Interactive virtual environments in VR and AR require real-time physics simulations running at around 60 frames per second. And design optimization done in the aerospace industry requires simulations to execute on the order of days or weeks as opposed to months. And so to set the stage here, um, I would, uh, I, I'll just provide an example from my current employer on what, a time, what this time critical situation looks like. Um, so in VR and AR, what we're hoping to do is create very immersive experiences wherein users can manipulate virtual objects with high dexterity and have sort of realistic sensations rendered to them, um, both visually and haptically. And in this example that our team put together, you see we're playing a game of Gen Jenga. And this is actually done by design because right now in order to obtain real-time physics simulations, we have to live with rigid body dynamics, which means that any individual object only has six degrees of freedom. And this duck, which we know is squishy, actually cannot be simulated as such. We have to assume that it's a fixed object. And so right now, all sort of uh, virtual interactions with, with these physical objects um, basically corresponds to you using your mannequin hands to uh, move around fixed blocks. And so that prevents us from doing a lot of um, really high fidelity interactions that might be required for surgical applications, um, playing with silly putty and things of that nature. So this is one um, barrier that's in my current employer where they would like to some, somehow find a way to have high, higher fidelity models run in real time. At my former employer, we were working on uh, problems of interest in national security. And so one example that we considered for a while was a so-called so captive carry problem, where the goal of the analysis is to compute the pressure exerted on a store um, when it's immersed in a three-dimensional cavity over a wide range of operating conditions of an aircraft, so different Mach numbers and angles of attack. And so our analysts at Sandia put together a validated and predictive uh, fluid structure interaction model uh, where they were really happy with the predictive accuracy. So we see here um, the pressure visualized on that store. And on the right, I'm showing a two-dimensional slice through that three-dimensional cavity. And I'm visualizing um, the gradient of the density. And you can see the, the physics are quite complex and multi-scale, um, which means that we had to imbue the model with fine resolution. So this model on the right was characterized by 100 million cells and 200,000 time steps. Um, so that just one of these simulations consumes six weeks on 5,000 cores. So the price we paid for this uh, you know, 5% error was an extremely expensive uh, simulation. And that precludes, uh, precludes engineers from using this model for a wide range of these important time critical problems like fully exploring, exploring the flight envelope, performing uncertainty quantification, model predictive control, as I mentioned, as well as, as robust design of the storing cavity. So in national security applications, this barrier um, is, is quite uh, an inhibitor in terms of uh, the accuracy that we can ob obtain with these time-critical problems. 
some of you may have seen a few years ago that NASA also articulated this barrier um, quite nicely. So they issued a high performance fast computing challenge where they said the following. So despite tremendous progress made in the past few decades, computational fluid dynamics tools are too slow for simulating complex geometry flows, taking from thousands to millions of core hours. So the example I just showed actually was 5 million core hours. So it's right in the wheelhouse of what they're considering. And to enable high fidelity CFD for multidisciplinary analysis and design, which is their time critical problem, they want to accelerate uh, simulations by between one and three orders of magnitude. And I'll show you in this talk how we've actually been able to successfully leverage AI tools to exactly hit this, um, th this criterion. So we were able to actually get two orders of magnitude cost reduction by leveraging AI methods. Um, so this is just to set the context for our work. Now we'll get into a little bit more um, of the details of how we we're able to achieve that. So I'm gonna have to use a little bit of math. Hopefully this isn't gonna turn off most of the audience, but I'm gonna keep it rather simple. Um, and I need to introduce the, the, this notation just to explain how exactly we are leveraging AI in our problem space. So it turns out for many uh, computational physics problems, you can express them as a parameterized system of nonlinear or ordinary differential equations. And that's a mouthful. But if you look at the equations that I'm writing here, X here is a, is a state vector. Often it's of length, say 100 million. And each entry in that vector corresponds to usually a physical unknown at some point in space. And F here is the velocity vector, which tells us basically the rate of change of our solution um, as it evolves in time. Uh, T represents time and this uh, variable mu represent different parameters in our simulation. So mu might correspond to or include design variables like let's say the length of the cavity or the width of the cavity. The second expression there just says that we're gonna start at some initial point. Um, that's how we're gonna start a simulation. We're gonna solve in some finite time window, zero to T final, and our parameters live in some space D. So what is a time critical problem in this uh, notation? Basically, all it's saying is that we'd like to rapidly solve this ODE, where rapidity is defined by the constraints of your problem. So for health monitoring, we might have a, a, you know, a constraint of, 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 let's say, an hour, whereas for model predictive control, we might have a, a time constraint of a millisecond. Um, we want to rapidly solve this ODE for arbitrary points in parameter space. And again, each point here, each blue point corresponds to a specific design, for example, that we want to simulate our, our system at. And so how do we bring AI into the picture to solve this problem? Because just trying to tackle this directly is intractable. As I mentioned, running one of these simulations might consume uh, months on a supercomputer, even at one blue point. So the idea of what we're gonna do, um, uh, the way we're gonna leverage machine learning and AI is we're going to run the expensive simulation at a handful of points shown in red, and then run the typical training machine learning and reduction um, you know, flow of, of AI in order to realize this goal. So what we do is we take a handful of these points, we run our expensive simulation, and we collect a whole host of simulation data, which characterizes basically how our solution tends to evolve over time and parameters. Then what we do is we apply a variety of supervised and unsupervised machine learning methods to that data to identify important structure. I'll particularize this later on in the talk, but the point is we, we use a variety of methods to sort of mine that data for important structure. And then number three, we leverage that structure to reduce the cost of solving our model at all the remaining blue points. And this is sort of a meta algorithm. I'm not prescribing exactly what is done in each step, um, but I'll do that in, in the subsequent slides. And so if you're a physics person or you come from an engineering field, um, you might already be a bit skeptical because we know, let's say, for example, for fluid dynamicists that our, that our model should always obey conservation laws. If we are um, molecular dynamic scientists, we might know that our, the, the, our system must evolve according to symplectic time evolutions. There are all these like important physical properties that our original model often obeys that we must preserve in our reduced order model. And those types of considerations um, allowed us to sort of articulate five desiderata or criteria that we would like in our reduced model. So it can't just be fast. It has to also satisfy other properties. Um, number one, which is somewhat obvious, is that it should be accurate. And so let's say sub 1% errors in the state space is what we'd like to achieve. Number two, clearly it should be low cost, which is getting directly at our goal. And so we're gonna target two orders of magnitude uh, computational cost reduction. So we can start running in near real time. Number three is what I was just alluding to, which is structure preservation. So we would like to preserve whatever important physical properties were intrinsic to our original model in the reduction process. And this is sort of, you know, depends on the problem that you're solving what structure preservation looks like. Number four is guaranteed generalization. So we want our reduced model to sort of always work. That is, it, it should always satisfy one through three for any point in parameter space, even when the problem is very challenging. 
Because if this doesn't occur, then we can then analysts are, are unlikely to use our methods. And number five is certification, meaning that once we run our cheap model, we would like to know how accurate it was a posteriori so we can make decisions based on that approximate model. And so our research over the past 10 years has really hit all five of these criteria. And I don't have uh, you know, three hours to talk to you today. So I'm just gonna focus in on a few of, of the contributions that are more recent and that leverage sort of the more recent um, uh, developments in deep learning. So I'll first talk about how we uh, imbue the model with accuracy. So I'm gonna now make this meta algorithm a little bit more concrete. So I mentioned step one was training. So what does training mean? So we pick one point in parameter space, this red point shown here. Again, this just means that we have frozen the design of the system. And then we, we're gonna simulate uh, the, the physical system for this parameter instance. And so what we do is as we simulate in time, we collect the solution vector as a column in this matrix that we're concatenating these solution vectors together such that at the end of one simulation, we have an N by T matrix where N is the number of um, unknowns in our state vector, say that's about hundred million and T is the number of time steps we've taken, say that's around hundred thousand. So this matrix basically includes, it represents how our solution behaves in space and time. If we repeat this training exercise at several other points, we can concatenate all these vectors together to form what we call the snapshot matrix, which contains rich data about how our solution actually behaves in practice over time and parameter variation. Um, so what we can do is we can take this data and then we apply machine learning to it. And so right now I'm gonna, this is sort of the state of the art in our field about eight years ago. Um, so if we want to reduce the cost of solving our system, what is the you know, logical thing to do? So one might imagine introducing a dimensionality reduction method. And the most popular such method and most widely used is principal component analysis. So we apply that now to our physical data in the following sense. So we take this snapshot matrix, we compute the singular value decomposition, if you're familiar with the SVD, and then we truncate the left singular vector such that we preserve only the dominant principal components of our solution modes. And so intuitively, the columns of phi here correspond to like the dominant physical behavior that we tend to see over our training simulations. From that, we define a low dimensional subspace. So that's basically the span of all elements of the range of phi. And we're gonna restrict our solution to evolve in that subspace. And this is, if you're a dynamics person, this is what's known as a kinematic approximation. So we're gonna say that no matter what happens with the dynamics, I'm gonna say my solution must live in this subspace that I've learned from my data via uh, PCA. And just to give you an idea, if we have three state vectors and we're reducing the dimension by two, what this yields is a plane um, in, in, in state space. So we're gonna restrict our solution to live in a plane in this case. More generally, we're restricting to live in a hyperplane. So now that we've defined a kinematic approximation, we must prescribe the dynamics, which is how does the system actually evolve on this kinematically approximated subspace? So if you're familiar with numerical ODEs and numerical methods, you know that in order to actually solve any system of ordinary differential equations on a computer, you must introduce a time discretization method. So you may have heard of, Run of runga kutta methods or linear multi-step schemes. What this does is it actually discretizes our model because we know that computers must operate in finite arithmetic. And so at the end of the day, what we're actually solving with our original model is a sequence from one to T of uh, systems of nonlinear algebraic equations. So this is what's typically done in a, uh, in a, in a computational physics code. So how can we take our principal components and integrate it into this model such that we reduce its dimensionality? So the most typical approach that you know, had dominated our field for a few decades was known as Galerkin projection, where what, what this model does is it basically takes the time continuous ODE model and it minimizes the time continuous residual R here, which is the misfit of the left and right hand sides over the subspace that we're generating approximations over. And this is a nice property because we have time continuous optimality, right? Our, our, our approximation here is the solution to a minimization problem where we're minimizing some notion of the error. In our research, what we showed is that in general, you cannot prove that the corresponding discrete solution is optimal in any sense. So we must of course apply time discretization to this model. And we showed that this actually causes us to lose optimality in the final computed uh, solution. And this has led to, and, and we basically show how that, that this leads to a lot of issues in terms of how, um, how unstable or inaccurate the solution can be. So rather than adopting this view, what we pursued was sort of discretizing and then optimizing. Um, and so what we do instead is we look at the discrete equations directly and minimize the residual over the principal component space. And then this yields basically a different model that we call least squares petrov galerkin or LSPG projection. And we've shown over a whole host of large scale examples that this is actually 
the proper way to integrate um, these low dimensional subspaces into a physics code to realize superior performance when you have stiff dynamics, which often arises in turbulent flows. Um, so just to show you how this works on that problem I showed earlier, this captive carry problem, um, we're gonna take a, a simplified version of that. We'll solve the unsteady Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, we'll consider a turbulent compressible flow about a million degrees of freedom. So our state vector is about, contains about a, a million elements and about 10,000 time steps. And I'm, gonna, and I'm gonna show you how sort of how this LSPG model works um, over this principal component subspace. So recall that the LSPG model is solving this time discrete residual minimization problem over the subspace spanned by the columns of phi, which are our principal modes. So one thing we discovered in our, in our work was that analogously to how SGD works, we don't actually have to minimize the L2 norm of the entire residual vector, which in this case is of length 1 million. Instead, we can actually subsample the residual by introducing the semi-norm theta and only really do calculations on a small part of the mesh. And this was actually key to realizing computational cost reduction. And so when we actually run our reduced model, we don't need to load in the entire mesh. We just need to load in a very small subset of that mesh. And then I can run it on the very laptop that I'm presenting to you, uh, that, I, that I'm presenting um, on to you today. So the idea here is we now have, are able to do high performance computing caliber simulations on simply a laptop. And here are the results we get. So the top row is from our LSPG model. The bottom row is from the high fidelity model. I'm visualizing the vorticity and pressure fields. And you see here, we get nearly identical solutions. Um, indeed, quantitatively, we have less than 1% error in the drag. And we've been able to accelerate the simulation by two orders of magnitude, which is really exciting. And that's because we are reducing the dimensionality of the problem by multiple orders of magnitude. And so this is very exciting. Um, and hopefully you're convinced here that, that this combination of AI and projection onto the modes learned by um, le learned by AI is sort of a promising um, step forward towards enabling real time simulations of high fidelity models because there's no way you could achieve this sort of performance with traditional methods like mesh coarsening. But the question is, can we do even better with modern AI? So if you're a practitioner of machine learning, you know that PCA was invented over about 120 years ago in 1901. So it's a bit of a stretch to claim what we've done up to this point as AI, right? It's really sort of traditional statistics incorporating, uh, incorporated with uh, physics simulation. Um, so, so let's see if we can do better uh, by leveraging modern AI. And we're gonna target exactly, basically replacing PCA with a more modern approach for dimensionality reduction. And if you're familiar with, 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 with this field, you're, you'll immediately identify that what we're trying to identify and what we're trying to learn here is a nonlinear manifold. And there are many different ways in the literature of, of computing nonlinear manifolds, but we found that um, autoencoders from deep learning are an extremely you know, flexible and accurate way to generate a low dimensional manifold um, of our solution space that significantly outperforms PCA. And so I'll explain that how, how we've done that uh, now. So if, you, so if you are familiar with autoencoders, you know that basically they're a neural network architecture that tries to copy inputs to outputs. So we feed in some vector x, here it's of length eight, and we try to copy it to an x tilde vector um, with as little loss as possible. So we want x tilde to match x. So why is that interesting, right? Intrinsically, it's not interesting to copy a vector to itself, but what is interesting is that if we can do so with this particular type of architecture, where we must go through a bottleneck, in this case of dimension two, we know that if we can successfully do this, that there exists a low dimensional manifold of dimension two that can accurately represent all of the solutions that, that, we're, that we're considering. And so the idea here is, the first part is known as the encoder, the latter part is the decoder. The decoder in these architectures actually define a nonlinear manifold whose dimension corresponds to, to the dimensionality of, of, of the of sort of the, the, the waist of the hourglass uh, topology here. Um, and if you're a differential geometry person, you'll identify that this decoder provides exactly a parameterization of that manifold. And so how do we modify our meta algorithm to include, um, include the, 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 this kind of approach? So recall we have this snapshot matrix. So rather than taking the SVD and just looking at the principal components, we can feed each column of this snapshot matrix through an autoencoder architecture, try to copy each column to a counterpart X tilde, and basically train the neural network to minimize the, the loss or the difference between these two matrices. And if we do that successfully and we get a, a small loss function, then we can define our nonlinear manifold from this decoder. And that allows us to go beyond what we're able to achieve with PCA um, using these autoencoders. And I wanna emphasize here that there's basically no, we're using the same data as previously and no specialized problem knowledge um, to, to obtain uh, this approximation. <clears throat> 
So intuitively, why might this be a good idea? So um, PCA generated a linear subspace. I've written this in previous slides. And you know, if we have a three-dimensional space and we're reducing it to two-dimensional subspace, you obtain a plane um, in three dimensions. And so the kinematic approximation was, as I'm showing here, we, we say state must be the state must be represented by a linear combination of the columns of phi. Um, and the velocity lives in the same space. So if we instead use this autoencoder, we can define a nonlinear manifold which is defined by this, by this G function, which comes from the decoder of the autoencoder. And then we, can, we have a lot more flexibility to define any kind of topology that we want to look for solutions over. So it's common in, in physical problems that we don't actually live in a, in a subspace of the original solution space. We often live in some highly nonlinear manifold of that space. So this, this, um, this sort of uh, functional form allows us to capture much more interesting and complex um, uh, solution manifolds than we could achieve with linear subspaces. Um, and if we, you know, flush out sort of what the kinematics are in this case, uh, we represent our state as being expressed by this decoder function G. So our manifold can have, again, general structure. We only enforce it to be continuously differentiable. And then if we apply the chain rule, we can immediately see that the velocity must live in the tangent space of the manifold at any point in time. And if we do this, we can enforce consistent, consistent kinematics where the solution and its, and its uh, time derivative all live properly on this, on, this, um, on this differentiable manifold. So in terms of dynamics, as I explained earlier, um, in the PCA case, we had two ways of generating dynamics. One was Galerkin projection, where we minimized the L2 norm of the con time continuous residual over those modes. And then LSPG, where we minimized the discrete residual over those modes. So instead, if we substitute phi with our manifold, we get the following models. One is a, the corresponding Galerkin model minimizes the time continuous residual over the tangent space, because we're computing velocities in this case. And the LSPG model minimizes the time discrete residual. And so in this case, we get optimal dynamics because we're, we're optimal in the sense that we're minimizing a loss function. Um, and we also, I want to emphasize, get a model that is interestingly integrating deep learning with physics um, in a single model. So I'm gonna, if we dive into each term here, the brown terms, so namely the G, comes from our autoencoder, whereas the R comes from our physics code. So in order to get this model to work, we have to actually hook up TensorFlow or PyTorch with a, high, with a large scale computational physics code. And so what's happening, if you can kind of intuit um, of what's going on under the hood, is we're generating approximate solutions we're then evaluating how accurate they are by you know, computing this residual, which should be zero, at a subset of points in the mesh, and then basically um, kind of inverting for the proper state in that manifold that minimizes the misfit of the real physics. And so this has been a really cool project to see how we can hook up deep learning tools with computational physics tools to you know, yield real-time uh, simulations that are highly accurate. So just a few examples are the, the team at Sandia is currently implementing um, all these methods in, in their large scale codes now, but just to illustrate sort of the promise of this approach, I have a few uh, sort of small scale problems that really get to the point quite well. So I'm, I'm gonna consider on the left here, Berger's equation, which um, don't worry about the math, but it basically is, is modeling a shock wave propagating through a domain. This is common, a common phenomenon in, um, in fluid dynamics. And on the right, uh, this is a 2D reacting flow problem, which is common in combustion where you have some kind of advection phenomenon, dissipation phenomenon, and then a source term um, that you're modeling that, that generates heat or generates um, any, any of the conserved variables. The autoencoder architecture we're going to use is a convolutional autoencoder. And if you're familiar with CNNs, these are very popular in computer vision because they, they basically leverage the, the underlying like structure and format of images and videos uh, to generate representations that are translationally invariant, for example. And what we're doing here is we're leveraging the connection between image and video data with spatially laid out physics data, as you might encounter in a finite difference, finite element or finite volume model. And so by leveraging just these, these vanilla autoencoder architectures that are developed for computer vision, it turns out we can actually do really well in the, in the case of physics simulations, which is, which is quite interesting. Um, and again, the decoder is gonna define our manifold. So just to show you how well this works, on, on the left column, I'm gonna show our high fidelity model, which is this Berger's equation. And in the middle, I'm gonna show the best you can possibly do with PCA of dimension three. And so what we see here is that even though it's a really fairly simple problem, right? Of a discontinuity moving from left to right over time, um, the PCA approach is, is, does a very, very poor job of this. And intuitively this is happening because 
PCA leverages spatially fixed modes. And so there's really no way of capturing a moving discontinuity um, with, with, spatial, with a small number of spatially fixed modes. And this is why model reduction has been so difficult to achieve for a wide range of problems in fluid dynamics that are advection dominated. So I'm gonna now show you what we get with an autoencoder using the exact same dimension. So silk dimension three and using the exact same training data. So the only thing we're doing is we're swapping out PCA for an autoencoder. And what you'll see here is we get near perfect reconstruction, which is extremely exciting. So when I show this, uh, this plot to people in the model reduction community, they are nearly fall out of their seats because it's well known that this phenomenon is, is really hard to capture, nearly impossible to capture with a linear subspace. So the, 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 the point here is that, um, is that by leveraging methods from deep learning, we're able to really overcome a significant fundamental barrier that the field has faced in the past. So let's look at how, how these models work with a full-blown uh, reduced order model on both cases. So um, the top row is uh, the high fidelity model. The bottom row is the, um, is the reduced order model based on PCA. And we see, as one would expect, really poor performance with, with this uh, reduced order model of dimension five. But again, if I replace PCA with the autoencoder, we get the following results, which are you know, nearly perfect in the eyeball norm. So this just goes to show that, you know, uh, by, by making this, this, this advance and moving beyond linear subspaces and leveraging modern AI methods, we can uh, really get towards much more accurate real-time simulations. Um, and so I'm going to move on now to uh, one other topic before I kind of wrap things up. Um, that is structure preservation. So as I mentioned earlier, when we do model reduction, if you're you know, a rigorous computational physicist, you want to make sure that your reduction process obeys uh, physical laws. And as you may be aware, most generic methods in machine learning are designed to just minimize like the mean squared error of the training loss or some kind of like KL divergence between the training, uh, between the, 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 the data generating distribution and, and, the, the, uh, and the distribution generated by your model. Um, and so none of those have anything to do with sort of physical conservation or physical properties at all. So we've had to really think outside the box in order to achieve um, AI methods that, that can satisfy physical laws. And so to set the stage for this, I'm going to kind of introduce some, some notation from the finite volume method. So if you're not familiar with the finite volume method, um, this is a discretization method that's common in fluid dynamics, where what they aim to do is basically exactly enforce conservation, um, Newton's laws of mass, momentum, and energy conservation over, uh, over different control volumes that define your space. And so when we're dealing with a finite volume method, each element of this ODE has a very specific interpretation. So here's just a, a simple picture of a two-dimensional problem. What finite volume methods do is they basically carve up physical space into little puzzle pieces. And over each puzzle piece, they try to numerically enforce conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. And so what this implies is that, as I mentioned, each element of the state in velocity have a specific interpretation. So in particular, each element of the state vector x corresponds to the average value of one of these conserved variables, mass, momentum, or energy, over a control volume. And each element of the velocity vector uh, corresponds to the flux and source of that term over that control volume. So the flux, all that means is that that's basically measuring how much of that quantity is leaving the domain. Um, and the source is how much of that quantity is being generated within that domain. So with those interpretations, you can see immediately that the misfit between the left and right hand sides of that ODE or the residual directly measure the rate at which we're violating conservation. So that's how we interpret the ODE residual for finite volume methods. If we introduce a time discretization method, we integrate in time and we get a very similar interpretation. It's just that now each element of the residual corresponds to how much we're violating conservation over a given time step. And because the high fidelity model sets these residuals to zero, um, that means that finite volume methods uh, preserve, they're basically conservative. They enforce conservation explicitly. And so if we're dealing with a finite volume model, then our reduced order model should also enforce conservation. That's what we wanna do. So what happens with these models that I just proposed, right? So we're minimizing the time continuous and time discrete residuals over this deep learning manifold. Um, so what these are doing is they're minimizing basically the L2 norm of the, uh, the, the sum of square of violation of conservation, either rates or over a time step. And because the objective function is generally gonna be non-zero, neither directly enforces conservation. So it's very possible and even likely that each of these models would lead to spurious generation or dissipation of mass, momentum, and energy over time, which can really lead to problems when you're, when you're an analyst. Um, and so what we're gonna do is actually leverage the optimization structure to directly enforce conservation. So what we do is we take these objective functions and we augment them with, 
nonlinear equality constraints that explicitly enforce conservation over subdomains of the problem. So those green equations are basically saying that I want to minimize, um, you know, the, the, the overall uh, violation of conservation, but I'm going to ensure that I exactly enforce conservation over some part of the problem. And in particular, you could set just basically one domain to be the entire domain and enforce global conservation, which means that when you, when you zoom out, even if locally I'm violating conservation, the overall problem is doing the right thing and we're, we're not, we're, and we're, we're conserving mass momentum and energy over the entire domain. And so that's a really nice property. So if we go back to this um, example, and I, you know, we have, we have uh, several journal articles on this at this point, so I don't have time to go into details on terms of all the different results we've generated. But in a nutshell, this is sort of what you can take away. So this is the result I showed earlier, where we have a high fidelity model, um, a PCA subspace and an autoencoder. And as I showed, the PCA um, model doesn't do very well and it violates conservation by quite a bit. And even though the autoencoder does quite well, it still has a violation of conservation of 1%. So just by adding uh, those conservation constraints to, the, to the, the dynamics, what we can do is obtain results that look like this, which you know, if you just stare at it, they look quite similar. But if you actually go in and calculate what's happening, um, both of those reduced order models essentially enforce global conservation to machine precision. So that's really encouraging um, for folks who are working in, in fluid dynamics where you want to guarantee that these properties hold. So just to, to summarize here and provide a bit of an outlook, I've explained sort of how we go from generic model reduction to using deep learning and then furthermore how we enforce uh, physical laws by a clever definition of the dynamics. Um, and so the, the interesting thing here that I want to kind of reemphasize is that our, our approach integrates directly computational physics and deep learning. As I mentioned, those, those brown terms correspond to deep learning, the blue terms correspond to something that is computed by our physics model. So we're directly integrating um, these, the, these two notions. Um, if you're in the AI community, you might identify this as a latent dynamics model because latent dynamics models generally describe how some latent variables that, that are a compression of your solution variable evolve in time. But nearly every method in the literature is purely data-driven in that they basically train all the dynamics and everything offline. And then when you run the model, you're completely di divorced from the original uh, physics model that you're running. Whereas in our case, we're always sort of you know, tied to that model. So we, can, we, we get accurate estimates of how accurate um, our model actually is and the error that's incurred by our approximation. Um, I also want to emphasize that, that to compute gradients, we actually just call backprop in, in TensorFlow or uh, PyTorch. So the quasi-Newton solvers that we employ for these nonlinear least squares problems, namely SQP, are directly calling uh, backpropagation. In ongoing work, as I alluded to earlier, um, at Sandia, they're, they're integrating a lot of this stuff in the, in the large-scale code that, they, that is known as Presio. And the goal is that they'll be using this in a lot of their national security work moving forward. So with that, I'd be happy to take questions. I've just listed, uh, if you're interested, a few of the references that relate to the topics that I discussed today. And uh, I'd be happy to take questions. If I don't know how that exactly works, but. Yep, so I think we have time for one question here. Uh, and we do have one in the Q&A. If anybody has additional questions after this session, they can always connect with Kevin in the chat feature on Whova. So the first question we have for you is, is it fair to say these techniques as approximating the complex differential equations that underlie physics sims? The error quantification must be a breakthrough piece, if so, because for some applications, there can't be a large departure from ground truth. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I unfortunately didn't have time to go into this um, in much detail, but actually what we've developed here is, um, um, I, yeah, I, I'm tempted to pull up slides, but I'll just say that we're able to actually actually calculate a posteriori the error in our approximation quite accurately. And what we're leveraging there are sort of LSTM models for regression of the error of the model. So the way we do that is we basically, at our training points, we run both the high fidelity model and the reduced model. We generate a host of features that correspond to residual based quantities that are informative of the error and feature and responses which correspond to the real ROM error. And then we generate like an LSTM or RNN model that can accurately predict those errors. So then you're absolutely, the question questioner is correct that that's really important for us to understand how accurate that model is. But in addition to that, what we can actually do is refine our model online and increase its fidelity incrementally, almost for free. And we do that basically by um, like kind of like transfer learning ideas where we retrain part of our network online to further reduce the error. 
so in, in my view, I'm glad that this person thinks it's a breakthrough because I, I would like to think so as well. <laughs> but yeah, it's a pretty powerful method um, with the combination of adaptivity and accurate error quantification in that you can run these fast models with very strong uh, guarantees on how accurate it's going to be. Um, so yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, very cool. And if you want to continue that conversation, you are able to do that in the session Q&A. Uh, with that, before we run out of time, I think we'll wrap it up here. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, if anyone else has additional questions for Kevin, go to the session Q&A and chat and he will be able to keep responding to you there. Thank you. Thank you.